Hello, and welcome to the Dozing Off Podcast. A podcast meant for the person that, when their head hits the pillow at night, their mind just seems to run riot, and they just need something to listen to that'll allow them to put that overactive mind at ease and fall asleep. In this podcast, I'll be reading classic literature and short stories in this deep and relaxing tone to do just that for you, allow you to doze off. Tonight, I will be reading four short stories from the fairy tales of Hans Christian Andersen. Thank you so much for tuning in, and here we go. Story number one, The Bell. In the narrow streets of a large town, people often heard in the evening when the sun was setting, and his last rays gave a golden tint to the chimney pots. A strange noise which resembled the sound of a church bell. It only lasted an instant, for it was lost in the continual roar of traffic and hum of voices which rose from the town. The evening bell is ringing, people used to say. The sun is setting. Those who walked outside the town, where the houses were less crowded, and interspersed by gardens and little fields, saw the evening sky much better, and heard the sound of the bell much more clearly. It seemed as though the sound came from a church, deep in the calm, fragrant wood, and thought their people looked with devout feelings. A considerable time elapsed. One said to the other, I really wonder if there is a church out in the woods. The bell has indeed a strange, sweet sound. Shall we go there and see what the cause of it is? The rich drove, the poor walked, but the way seemed to them extraordinarily long. And when they arrived at a number of willow trees on the border of the wood, they sat down, looked up into the great branches, and thought they were now really in the wood. A confectioner from the town also came out and put up a stall there. Then came another confectioner who hung a bell over his stall, which was covered with pitch to protect it from the rain, but the clapper was wanting. When people came home, they used to say that it had been very romantic. And that really means something else than merely taking tea. Three persons declared that they had gone as far as the end of the wood. They had always heard the strange sound, but there it seemed to them as if it came from the town. One of them wrote verses about the bell and said that it was like the voice of a mother speaking to an intelligent and beloved child. No tune, he said, was sweeter than the sound of the bell. The emperor of the country heard of it, and declared that he who would really find out where the sound came from should receive the title of bell ringer to the world, even if there was no bell at all. Now many went into the wood for the sake of this splendid birth but only one of them came back with some sort of explanation. None of them had gone far enough, nor had he. And yet he said that the sound of the bell came from a large owl in a hollow tree. It was a wisdom owl, which continually knocked its head against the tree. But he was unable to say with certainty whether its head the hollow trunk of the tree was the cause of the noise. He was appointed bell ringer of the world and wrote every year a short dissertation on the owl. But by this means, P 
people do not become any wiser than they had been before. It was just confirmation day. The clergyman had delivered a beautiful and touching sermon. The candidates were deeply moved by it. It was indeed a very important day for them. They were all at once transformed from mere children to grown-up people. The childish soul was to fly over, as it were, into a mere reasonable being. The sun shone most brightly, and the sound of the great unknown bell was heard more distinctly than ever. They had a mind to go thither, all except three. One of them wished to go home and try on her ball dress. For this very dress and the ball were the cause of her being confirmed this time. Otherwise, she would have not have been allowed to go. The second, a poor boy, had borrowed a coat and a pair of boots from the son of his landlord to be confirmed in, and he had to return them at a certain time. The third said that he never went into strange places if his parents were not with him. He had always been a good child and wished to remain so, even after being confirmed. And they ought to not tease him for this. They, however, did it all the same. These three, therefore, did not go. The others went on. And the sun was shining. The birds were singing, and the confirmed children sang too, holding each other by the hand, for they had no position yet, and they were all equal in the eyes of God. Two of the smallest soon became tired and returned to the town. Two little girls sat down and made garlands of flowers. They, therefore, did not go on. When the others arrived at the willow trees, where the confectioner had put up his stall, they said, Now we are out here. The bell does not in reality exist. It is only something that people imagine. Then suddenly, the sound of the bell was heard so beautifully and solemnly from the wood that four or five of them made up their minds to go still further on. The wood was very thickly grown. It was difficult to advance. Wood lilies and anemones grew almost too high. Flowering convolvii and brambles were hanging like garlands from tree to tree, while the nightingales were singing and the sunbeams played. That was very beautiful, but the way was unfit for the girls. They would have torn their dresses. Large rocks covered with moss of various hues were lying about. The fresh spring water rippled forth with a peculiar sound. I don't think that can be the bell, said one of the confirmed children. And then he lay down and listened. We must try to find out if it is. And then he remained and let the others walk on. They came to a hut built of bark of trees and branches. A large crab apple tree spread its branches over it, as if it intended to pour all its fruit on the roof, upon which roses were blooming. The long boughs covered the gable, where a little bell was hanging. Was this the one they all heard? All agreed that it must be so, except one who said that the bell was too small and too thin to be heard at such a distance, and that it had to be a quite different sound to that which has touched men's hearts. He who spoke was a king's son, and therefore the other said that such a one always wishes to be cleverer than other people. Therefore they let him go alone, and as he walked on, the solitude of the wood produced a feeling of reverence in his breast. But still he heard the little bell about which the others rejoiced, and sometimes when the wind blew in that direction, he could hear the sounds from the confectioner's stall 
where the others were singing at tea. But the deep sounds of the bell were much stronger. Soon it seemed to him as if an organ played an accompaniment. The sound came from the left, from the side where the heart is. Now something rustled among the bushes, and a little boy stood before the king's son in wooden shoes and such a short jacket that the sleeves did not reach to his wrists. They knew each other. The boy was the one who had not been able to go with them because he had to take the coat and boots back to the landlord's son. That he had done, and had started again in his wooden shoes and old clothes, for the sound of the bell was too enticing. He felt he must go on. We might go together, said the king's son. But the poor boy with the wooden shoes was quite ashamed. He pulled at the short sleeves of his jacket and said that he was afraid he could not walk so fast. Besides, he was of opinion that the bell ought to be sought out at the right, for there was all that was grand and magnificent. Then we shall not meet, said the king's son, nodding to the poor boy who went into the deepest part of the wood where the thorns tore his shabby clothes and scratched his hands, face, and feet until they bled. The king's son also received several good scratches. But the sun was shining on his way, and it is he whom we will follow now, for he was a quick fellow. I will and must find the bell, he said, if I have to go to the end of the world. Ugly monkeys sat high in the branches and clenched their teeth. Shall we beat him, they said. Shall we thrash him? He is a king's son, but he who walked on and daunted, deeper and deeper into the wood, where the most wonderful flowers were growing. There were standing white star lilies with blood-red stamens, sky-blue tulips shining when the wind moved them, apple trees covered with apples, like large glittering soap bubbles. Only think how resplendent these trees were in the sunshine. All around were beautiful green meadows, where Hart and Hind played in the grass. There grew magnificent oaks and beech trees, and if the bark was split of any of them, long blades of grass grew out of the clefts. There were also large smooth lakes in the wood on which the swans were swinging about and flapping their wings. The king's son often stood still and listened. Sometimes he thought that the sound of the bell rose up to him out of one of these deep lakes. But soon he found out that this was a mistake and that the bell was ringing still farther in the wood. Then the sun set. The clouds were red as fire. It became quiet in the wood. He sank down to his knees, sang an evening hymn, and said, I shall never find what I am looking for. Now the sun is setting, and the night, the dark night, is approaching. Yet, I may perhaps see the round sun once more before he disappears beneath the horizon. I will climb up these rocks. They are as high as the highest trees. And then, taking hold of the creepers and roots, he climbed up on the wet stones where water snakes were wiggling and the toads, as it were, barked at him. He reached the top before the sun, seen from such a height, had quite set. Oh, what a splendor! The sea, the great majestic sea, which was rolling its long waves against the shore, stretched out before him. And the sun was standing like a large bright altar. And there where the sea and heaven met, 
all melted together in the most glowing colors. The wood was singing in his heart too. The whole of nature was one large holy church in which the trees and hovering clouds formed the pillars, the flowers and grass, the woven velvet carpet, and heaven itself was the great cupola. Up there, the flame color vanished as soon as the sun disappeared, but millions of stars were lighted, diamond lamps were shining, and the king's son stretched out his arms towards heaven towards the sea, and towards the wood. Then suddenly, the poor boy with the short sleeve jacket and the wooden shoes appeared. He had arrived just as quickly on the road he had chosen, and they ran towards each other and took one another's hand. In the great cathedral of nature and posy, and above them sounded the invisible holy bell. Happy spirits surrounded them, singing hallelujahs and rejoicing. Story number two, The Bird of Popular Songs In his winter time, the earth wears a snowy garment and looks like marble honed out of the rock. The air is bright and clear. The wind is sharp as a well-tempered sword. And the trees stand like branches of white coral or blooming almond twigs. And here it is keen as on the lofty Alps. The night is splendid in the gleam of the northern lights and in the glitter of the innumerable twinkling stars. But we sit in the warm room by the hot stove and talk about the old times. And we listen to this story. By the open sea was a giant's grave. And on the grave mound sat at midnight the spirit of the buried arrow who had been a king. The golden circlet gleamed on his brow. His hair fluttered in the wind. And he was clad and steel, and iron. He bent his head mournfully, and sighed in deep sorrow, as an unquiet spirit might sigh. And a ship came sailing by. Presently, the sailors lowered the anchor and landed. Among them was a singer, and he approached the royal spirit, and said, Why mournest thou? And wherefore dost thou suffer thus? And the dead man answered, No one has sung the deeds of my life. They are dead or forgotten. Song doth not carry them forth over the lands, nor into the hearts of men. Therefore I have no rest and no peace, and he spoke of his works and of his warlike deeds, which his contemporaries had known, but which had not been sung, because there was no singer among his companions. And then the old bark struck the strings of his harp, and sang the youthful courage of the hero, of the strength of the man, and of the greatness of his good deeds, then the face of the dead one gleamed like the margin of the cloud in the moonlight. Gladly and of good courage, the form arose in splendor and in majesty, and vanished like the glancing of the northern light. Naught was to be seen but the green turfy mound, with the stones on which no runic record has been graven. But at least the sound of the harp there sounded over the hill, as though he had fluttered from the harp a little bird, a charming singing bird, with the ringing voice of the thrush, with the moving voice pathos of the human heart. 
with a voice that told of home, like the voice that is heard by the bird in passage. The singing bird soared away, over the mountain and valley, over field and wood. It was the bird of popular song who never dies. We hear his songs. We hear it now in the room while the white bees are swarming without and the storm clutches the windows. The bird sings not alone the requiem of heroes. He sings also sweet, gentle songs of love, so many and so warm, of northern fidelity and truth. He has stories and words and in tones. He has proverbs and snatches of proverbs, songs which, like Rooney's laid under a dead man's tongue, force him to speak, and thus popular song tells of the land of his birth. In the old heathen days, in the times of the Vikings, the popular speech was enshrined in the harp of the bard. In the days of the knightly castles, when the strongest fist held the scales of justice, when only might was right, and a peasant and a dog were of equal importance. Where did the bird of song find shelter and protection? And neither violence nor stupidity gave him thought. But in the gabled window of the knightly castle, the lady of the castle sat with the parchment roll before her and wrote down the old recollections and song and legend while near her stood the old woman from the wood and the traveling peddler who went wandering through the country. As these told their tales, there fluttered around them with twittering and song the bird of popular song who never dies so long as the earth has hell upon which his foot may rest. And now he looks upon us and sings, Without are the nights in the snowstorm. He lays the runes beneath our tongues, and we know the land of our home. Heaven speaks to us in our native tongue, in the voice of the bird of popular song, the old remembrances awake, the faded colors glow with a fresh lust. In story and song, pour our blessed drought, which lifts up our minds and our thoughts, so that the evening becomes as a Christmas festival. The snowflakes chase with each other, the ice cracks, the storm rules without. For he has the might, he is Lord, but not the Lord of all. It is winter time, the wind is sharp as a two-edged sword, and the snowflakes chase each other. It seems as though it had been snowing for days and weeks, and the snow lies like a great mountain over the whole town, like a heavy dream of the winter night. Everything on the earth is hidden away. Only the golden cross of the church, the symbol of faith, arises over the snow grave and gleams in the blue air and in the bright sunshine. And over the buried town fly the birds of heaven, the small and the great. They twitter and they sing as best as they may, each bird with its beak. First comes the band of sparrows. They pipe at every trifle in the streets and lanes, in the nests and the houses. They have stories to tell about the front buildings and the back buildings. We know the buried town, they say. Everything living in it is a peep, peep, beep. The black ravens and crows flew on over the white snow. Grub, grub, they cried. 
There's something to be got down there. Something to swallow. And that's most important. That's the opinion of most of them down there. And the opinion is good, good, good. The wild swans come flying on whirring pinions. And the sing of the noble and the great that will still sprout in the heavens of men down in the town which is resting beneath its snowy veil. No death is there. Life reigns yonder. We hear it on the notes that swell onward like the tones of the church organ, which sees us like the sounds from the elf hill, like the songs of Osian, like the rushing swoop of the wandering spirit's wings. What harmony! That harmony speaks to our hearts and lifts up our souls. It is the bird of popular song whom we hear. And in this moment, the warm breath of heaven blows down from the sky. There are gaps in the snowy mountains. The sun shines into the clefts. Spring is coming. The birds are returning. And new races are coming with the same home sounds in their hearts. Hear the story of the year. The night of the snowstorm. The heavy dream of the winter night. All shall be dissolved. All shall rise again in the beauteous notes of the bird of popular song who never dies. Story number three. The Buckwheat. Very often, after a violent thunderstorm, a field of buckwheat appears blackened and singed, as if a flame of fire had passed over it. The country people will say that this appearance is caused by lightning. But I will tell you what the sparrow says. And the sparrow heard it from an old willow tree, which grew near a field of buckwheat and is there still. It is a large, venerable tree, though a little crippled by age. The trunk has been split, and out the crevice grass and brambles grow. The tree bends forward slightly, and the branches hang quite down to the ground just like green hair. Corn grows in the surrounding fields, and not only rye and barley, but oats, pretty oats that, when ripe, look like a number of little golden canary birds sitting on a bow. The corn has a smiling look, and the heaviest and richest ears bend their heads, low as if a pious humility. Once there was also a field of buckwheat, and this field was exactly opposite to old willow tree. The buckwheat did not bend like the other grain, but erected its head proudly and stiffly on the stem. I am as valuable as any other corn, said he, and I am much handsomer. My flowers are as beautiful as the bloom of the apple blossom, and it is a pleasure to look at us. Do you know of anything prettier than we are, you old willow tree? And the old willow tree nodded his head, as if he said, Indeed I do. But the buckwheat spread itself out with pride and said, Stupid tree, he is so old that grass grows out of his body. There arose a very terrible storm. All the field flowers folded their leaves together or bowed their little heads, while the storm passed over them. But the buckwheat stood erect in its pride. Bend your head, as we do, said the flowers. I have no occasion to do so, replied the buckwheat. Bend your head, as we do, cried the ears of corn. The angel of the storm is coming. His wings spread from the sky above, to the earth beneath. He will strike you down before you can cry for mercy. 
but I will not bend my head, said the buckwheat. Close your flowers and bend your leaves, said the old willow tree. Do not look at the lightning when the cloud bursts. Even men cannot do that. In a flash of lightning, heaven opens, and we can look in. But the sight will strike even human beings blind. What then must happen to us, who only grow out of the earth, and are so inferior to them, if we venture to do so? Inferior indeed, said the buckwheat. Now I intend to have a peep into heaven. Proudly and boldly he looked up, while the lightning flashed across the sky as if the whole world were in flames. When the dreadful storm had passed, the flowers and the corn raised their drooping heads in the pure still air. Refreshed by the rain, but the buckwheat lay like a weed in the field, burnt to blackness by the lightning. The branches of the old willow tree rustled in the wind, and large water drops fell from his green leaves as if the old willow were weeping. Then the sparrows asked why he was weeping, when all around him was so cheerful. See, they said, how the sun shines and the clouds float in the blue sky. Do you not smell the sweet perfume from flower and bush? Wherefore do you weep, old willow tree? Then the willow told them of the haughty pride of the buckwheat, and of the punishment which followed in consequence. This is the story told me by the sparrows one evening, when I begged them to relate some tale to me. Story number four, Children's Prattle. At a rich merchant's house, there was a children's party and the children of rich and great people were there. The merchant was a learned man, for his father had sent him to college, and he had passed his examination. His father had been at first only a cattle dealer, but always honest and industrious, so that he had made money. And his son, the merchant, had managed to increase his store. Clever as he was, he had also a heart. But there was less said of his heart than of his money. All descriptions of people visited at the merchant's house, well-born as well as intellectual, and some who possessed neither of these recommendations. Now it was a children's party, and there was a children's prattle which is always spoken freely from the heart. Among them was a beautiful little girl who was terribly proud, but this had been taught her by the servants and not by her parents, who were far too sensible people. Her father was groom of the chambers, which is a high office at court, and she knew it. I am a child of the court, she said. Now, she might just as well have been a child of the cellar, for no one can help his birth. And then she told the other children that she was well-born, and said that no one who was not well-born could rise in the world. It was no use to read and be industrious, for if a person was not well-born, he could never achieve anything. And those names who end with Sen, said she, can never be anything at all. We must put our arms akimbo and make the elbow quite pointed, so as to keep these Sen people at a great distance. And then she stuck out her pretty little arms and made the elbows quite pointed to show how it was to be done and her little arms were very pretty, for she was a sweet-looking child. But the little daughter of the merchant became very angry at this speech, 
for her father's name was Peterson, and she knew that the name ended in sin. And therefore, she said as proudly as she could, but my papa can buy a hundred dollars worth of bonbons and give them away to children. Can your papa do that? Yes, and my papa, said the little daughter of the editor of a paper. My papa can put your papa and everybody's papa into the newspaper. All sorts of people are afraid of him, my mama says, for he can do as he likes with the paper. And the little maiden looked exceedingly proud, as if she had been a real princess who may be expected to look proud. But outside the door, which stood ajar, was a poor boy, peeping through the crack of the door. He was of such a lowly station that he had not been allowed to even enter the room. He had been turning the spit for the cook, and she had given him permission to stand behind the door and peep in at the very well-dressed children who were having such a merry time within. And for him, that was a great deal. Oh, if I could be one of them, thought he. And then he heard what was said about names, which was quite enough to make him more unhappy. His parents at home had not even a penny to spare to buy a newspaper. Much less could they write in one. And worse than all, his father's name, of course his own, ended in sin and therefore he could never turn out well, which was a very sad thought. But after all, he had been born into the world, and the station of life had been chosen for him, and therefore he must be content. And this is what happened on that evening. Many years passed, and most of the children became grown-up persons. There stood a splendid house in the town, filled with all kinds of beautiful and valuable objects. Everybody wished to see it, and people even came in from the country round to be permitted to view the treasures it contained. Which of the children whose prattle we have described could call this house his own? One would suppose it's very easy to guess. No, no. It is not so very easy. The house belonged to the poor little boy who stood on that night behind the door. He had become something really great, although his name ended in Sen. For it was the Waltzen. And the three other children, the children of good birth, of money, and of intellectual pride, well, They were respected and honored in the world, for they had been well provided for by birth and position, and they had no cause to reproach themselves with what they had thought and spoken on that evening long ago, for after all, it was mere children's prattle.